Hello and welcome to the Japan Business Podcast episode 3. My name is Eric Ahorner and I'm your host and the founder of Japan Business Consulting. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at sales channels in Japan. In episode 1, I gave you some background and an intro about myself. In episode 2, we were talking about how to generally navigate the Japanese market from a 30,000 foot view. And today we're going to dive into Japanese sales channels and go a bit deeper into the different nuances on which decisions you might make, need to make when starting to work with the Japanese market. Now, there are various sales channels in Japan and we have to identify three different, different categories. First of all, you have the different online platforms like Amazon, Rakuten and Yahoo Shopping, which uh, are known here in the US partially, but um, rather unknown, for example, is Yahoo Shopping or Rakuten, which is functioning more as a uh, cashback or cash rewards platform here in the US, which are still very popular in Japan and are basically, with Amazon, the top three on the market for online platforms. But there are also online platforms like iPros that uh, cater more towards the B2B sector, and uh, we will dive into those in a separate episode. The episode today is geared towards mainly B2C channels. There are also options in regards to forming uh, local partnerships with local businesses. As priorly mentioned in episode two, you can um, work with distributors or sales agents. And today I'm also going to introduce you some uh, all-in-one um, marketing agencies that help you from logistics to marketing to point of sales activities in Japan, um, even doing um, uh, Amazon or online platform management for you. Uh, then, last but not least, I'm going to talk quickly about a case study or an example where a U.S. company uh, made an effort to establish a physical store or a showroom. Um, this might be an option for you if you're a bit more advanced in your Japan market entry journey and want to take it to the next levels. Uh, now, as you can imagine, there are pros and cons for each of those activities and we're going to dive into them one by, by, one, by one. Now, first of all, the online platforms, I want to take a kind of a deep dive here. For that, I'm going to minimize my picture here and we're going to talk about first uh, Amazon uh, Japan if you didn't know yet for example um, uh, this is at the moment the biggest online platform in or like online shopping platform in Japan but it wasn't until a couple of years ago until a couple of years ago it was Rakuten and still combined with their um, travel and uh, other activities that they're doing, um, Rakuten is uh, still in terms of uh, revenue the biggest uh, platform in Japan because they're not only offering uh, online shopping. Then number three on uh, the online shopping platform um, uh, ranking is Yahoo Shopping Japan. Yes, Yahoo is still a big name in Japan um, and a lot of people uh, do purchase uh, on Japan still and leave their reviews. Now, just to give you an example of um, how you should optimize your listing in Japan and um, also um, to better understand the online shopping habits. What you can do to better understand if your product or your niche is listed in, in Amazon um, or in any of the other online platforms, you can, in case that isn't happening yet, you can, uh, happened yet, you can adjust here to, to English um, if necessary. And uh, what I would recommend you is to go to, let's adjust this to English for, for, to facilitate this, to go here to best sellers. This is called ranking in uh, Amazon Japan. So best sellers in English. And here you can see the best sellers 
by product category um, on Amazon CEO.japan. Those or these bestsellers of this ranking is um, uh, updated hourly, as you can see here. So depending on the sales revenue, um, these are updated by category hourly. So you, if you have, for example, let's go into uh, electronics, and there you have uh, a lot of different uh, options. You can look into what are the best sellers in electronics generally, and then you can narrow it down. For example, let's look into home audio, and then you can see there's a um, home audio and theater products for whatever reason. There's a power bank here, a mobile uh, battery under um, uh, home audio and theater products. But you can better understand what the rankings are and what might be uh, your competitor or your competition uh, in your respective niche. You can do the same for uh, Rakuten. So Rakuten unfortunately does not have an English option, um, but it's still worth considering. So um, you basically go to the second tab from the light, right? So this is this uh, dark orange between red and orange, dark orange. You go to ranking, which is in Katakana ranking. And there you can see the uh, different rankings um, by um, category. And this is daily ranking or real-time ranking. Now, here you can also um, change the uh, different categories. So if we go to the same uh, category as um, in Amazon, this is Denka or electronics. Let's go to the overall ranking. That, um, there's also ceramic uh, seed. So this is Okay, so this is a small heater, a fashionable heater here, uh, which is on number one. Um, and here's an air purifier or um, uh, one that uh, uh, gives like air humidity and uh, then air dryers and so on and so on. So here you can also go by ranking. For this one, you might need a Google Translate tool uh, if you don't speak Japanese or read Japanese um, because as mentioned uh, Rakuten does not have um, an English website so for you a good start would be Amazon but if you want to dive deeper I highly recommend you also checking out um, Rakuten because here you can also identify um, how different the um, uh, the the product listing is from product listings that you might be used to. So there's a, a lot of information in here, which usually, usually you do not have um, that much on a Amazon US website. So um, let's look at the listing here. This is more typically like in, in Japan, uh, sorry, like in the US, but um, you can see that um, the information might be um, not as detailed as on Rakuten. Rakuten in that aspect is a lot more Japanese. Japanese just love better, more information than not enough. So better, a lot of information, even if it's fine print, um, that is something that is much appreciated, even if it doesn't look aesthetically or design-wise that appealing. Then in Amazon shopping, we have a, a kind of a different approach. Here we have um, the best store. So you can go by uh, rankings of best store in the different categories. What are the different stores um, for this month or for the year? So let's go into electronics or smartphones. Um, then you also have area rewards. Let me see. Okay. So here you can see which stores were the most popular. They don't really have a ranking like on um, Amazon or Rakuten. Um, 
And you can see, for example, the best one is Kojima Yahoo Shopping. So Kojima is also, uh, together with Big Camera, that this is a, a, a big um, electronic store, and they also have a Yahoo Shopping store where they uh, do their online retail activities. Uh, so does Joshin Web. Those are all Yamada. Those are all basically big um, electronic stores in Japan that uh, dominate the um, the rankings here. Um, so much about the three different or main platforms. There are many other platforms like um, uh, Zozo Town and so on for fashion um, and so on. But those are the, the most important ones in regards to B2C. Moving on to uh, partnerships with uh, local businesses. So there are different options on how you can think about partnerships with, with local businesses. I just want to give you um, an example of what you can do uh, if you look for a partnership with local businesses. If you have a B2C product, it is usually best to find a distributor. Um, and uh, you can either contact Japan External Trade Organization or you can do a quick online research in uh, saying distribution for your specific product category and uh, then Japan. Uh, maybe if you want to take it one step further, use Google Translate to translate that and look for that and look for different partners and create a list of the different business partners that you might have. And in, in Japan, the different options and then try to contact them one by one. Of course, another option if you're not only interested in exporting, but long-term to open up a branch office uh, in Japan, Japan External Trade Organization um, might help you. Please keep in mind that they are partially government funded and their objective is to help you open a branch office in Japan, pay local sales tax in Japan and hire Japanese staff long-term. So this is how they are um, uh, basically uh, yeah, working on or how they are motivated to help you. If you just say that you're only interested in exporting, uh, chances are you won't get the support that you expect from um, Japan External Trade Organization, which is a trade promotion agency. Um, now, what you can also do is to work with a partner. I give you here an example. They're called CoView. Um, I had some meetings with them in the past with one past client and uh, they could be a local partner in regards to importing, in regards to, logis regards to logistics, marketing, sales and online platform, uh, online shopping platform management. So they can be the one-stop shop um, if you want uh, a um, kind of all-in-one solution, this might be an option for you to, to consider. Um, now, as an example of um, how, to, um, how to enter the Japanese market, I just pulled up one case study of a uh, past client of mine where I can uh, disclose the, the information it's been, uh, because it's been already a while ago. Um, so um, the musical instruments manufacturer, Earthquake Devices, um, a U.S. manufacturer of boutique uh, effects pedals for guitars and other electric instruments. Um, they um, managed to find a business partnership with Yamaha. What we did is we went uh, to a trade show, uh, to the biggest musical instruments trade show in the world, and uh, basically knocked on the doors and uh, tried to pitch to all the major distributors of uh, musical instruments and um, we were lucky enough to find representatives from Yamaha that uh, were open to listening to the Japanese presentations that we had prepared and uh, the pitch was successful and we did a, a due diligence on uh, top four candidates. One of them was Yamaha, uh, went even to Japan, looked at all their facilities and then the, um, the owners of the company made a decision on uh, going with Yamaha uh, basically because they uh, just felt that they had the, the best um, yeah, connections, uh, network and uh, marketing budget 
to give the Earthquake Devices brand what it deserves on the Japanese market. Um, and uh, they were um, yeah, successfully increasing their uh, revenue from, I think, less than $2,000 per year to uh, around $200,000 um, within the first year and um, uh, growing uh, consistently from there. So this is just, just an example. I also want to give you an example. Um, so this, in, this was in terms of business partnership, but I want to give you an example in terms of a physical store, what uh, has happened. So Forever 21 brand um, from the US, uh, US fashion brand, about four years ago, I think pre-COVID, um, retreated from the Japanese market. They were not successful. We're losing a lot of market share to online um, fashion stores like uh, Zozo Town and so on. And so what they did, they uh, because they also had like a branding of a fast food fashion, and that was not that much appreciated in Japan. So they moved to a um, uh, rather um, a uh, pop-up shop strategy where they would uh, just promote their uh, reintroduction uh, into the Japanese market uh, just temporarily and then focus on online for a while but then going uh, back into retail stores um, in a strategy uh, to up to 15 stores I think in 2028 um, we can look into this um, real quick. So the retailer reopened a showroom type store for a limited time in Tokyo's Shibuya Ward, which is like the most fashionable uh, ward or fashion conscious ward in Tokyo, uh, or I would say maybe even in Japan. Customers will only be able to look at, but not buy the brand's clothing there. So this is to reintroduce the brand. And then there will be Forever 21 will sell its items only online for the time being. But in April, it will open its first regular shop after its relaunch in Japan at the Lala Port Shopping Park in Kodama in Osaka. So um, the company aims to have 15 stores in Japan and achieve 10 billion yen or 74 million in sales in the fiscal uh, year ending in February 2028. So. What is also interesting, because they kind of made a, an agreement with Adastria, which is a large Japanese apparel company that runs popular brands such as uh, Global Work, is now in charge of product planning and sales for Forever 21 items. So they made a local partnership with um, uh, that brand to, um, uh, or this apparel company to reintroduce their items into the Japanese market. So um, this is, I think, also interesting. I'll go a bit more because um, this might be a good case study for uh, your situation as well. Before withdrawing, Forever 21 was regarded as a typical fast fashion brand, a business model where a clothing brand quickly produces and sells fashionable, inexpensive clothing. This time, however, it plans to change its image with clothing that is conscious of sustainability. Um, Again, based on market research, I think they did their homework, understanding what might be more appropriate for their brands to find acceptance on the Japanese market. Reflecting on lessons from the past, we will not make waste. We would like to shed the image of fast fashion, said Atsushi Sugita, president of Gatewind Co. Industrias subsidiary, who I guess is in charge of uh, Forever 21. Uh, in Japan. Forever 21 first entered the Japanese market in 2009 and had more than 20 stores. Its shop in Tokyo's Harajuku district was so popular that over that more than 3 million customers had passed through its doors just six months after opening. However, facing the increasing popularity of internet shopping and other factors, its management company went bankrupt in 2019. There you go, just before COVID. Itochu Corp, a major Japanese trading company, struck an exclusive distributorship agreement in Japan with an American company that had bought the rights to the brand. That made it possible for Forever 21 to re-enter the Japanese market. So um, Itochu is a big trade company, one of the five big trade companies among uh, Mitsubishi, Marubeni, Mitsui, uh, Sumitomo, and then Itochu. And uh, they um, 
started a distributorship agreement uh, with the American company that had bought its right, the rights to the brand Forever 21. So uh, that made it possible for Forever 21 to re-enter the Japanese market. Gatewin wanted to use the brand name Forever 21 because it has worldwide recognition, Sugita said. So Gatewin, I guess, being uh, part of Adastria, uh, which um, was then in turn working with Itochu, uh, the trading company that had this exclusive distributorship. Uh, in Japan, as you can see, there are many players. Sometimes that it how it how it works out uh, in Japan until you get to the right person, um, you might have to go over or through um, several channels to find the right uh, connection there. When Forever 21 first came to Japan, customers benefited from its affordable prices, such as a dress for just 1,000 yen, but the merchandise was seen as being cheap but poorly made. The brand was also criticized for discarding massive amounts of unsold clothing. This time, the average price of the brand's item will be approximately 4,000 yen and they will be of higher quality. It will also undertake initiatives to help protect the environment, such as collecting used clothing and drastically reducing the amount of water used to make a pair of jeans. So this, obviously, in terms of SDGs, Sustainable de uh, Development Goals, that are also, um, the consumers are also aware in Japan uh, and more and more people demand that or um, feel that, um, uh, let's say, obligation to follow those SDG requirements that uh, many companies are also following is uh, something they were considering. Now, uh, that was just an example of a case study of Forever 21 after they had not successfully or had retreated from the Japanese market, went back in there. Um, and um, so if you consider to set up a physical store uh, long term, you really have to take into consideration the importance of location and the design. Um, now. As you know, as I mentioned, this is the Tokyo Shibuya Award. So this would be uh, the most fashionable location in, um, uh, in Tokyo. And uh, people know that. So this is the perfect spot for Forever 21. Whatever niche you're in, try to do your due diligence on what might be the best location for your product or service. So if, if it's electronics, it might be Akihabara. Um, uh, if it's uh, anything related to fashion, um, Shibuya is a good spot, but there are many other spots in Japan that um, you should consider depending on your product or service that you're offering. Um, then, in addition, Japan in Japan you cannot really be successful if you only long term. In the short term, maybe yes, but long term if you only sell online. So there has to be a balance of online and offline. As you can see here. Um, Forever 21 really wanted to make sure, or let's say the Japanese business partners really knew how to reintroduce the brand to the Japanese market, showing the consumers that this was a reliable brand. They had stepped up their game in terms of quality um, and also price was increasing, but that people knew it's not just the same, same old, same old, but for a higher price. So they opened up this, this shop just for people, for consumers to look at the product. Now, um, what I would say in regards to um, the things that we've learned today is that, first of all, truly understand where you are in your niche. So do the market research, use the steps and the uh, options that I showed you in um, uh, in Amazon, on Rakuten, on Yahoo Shopping, and also um, consider when finding a business partner, utilizing Jetro, working with a marketing agency in Japan to, if you really want to minimize the work, get done everything from one uh, out of one hand. Um, because if you just work with a distributor, sometimes it can happen that they don't do a lot of marketing. Um, but only are doing logistics and not much more. And uh, you're wondering why there aren't any sales of your product in Japan. Um, and then 
last but not least, when you are in the state of opening up a uh, shop in Japan or when you are already successful to a certain amount online in Japan uh, or through a distributor, try or business partner, try to identify options of uh, having your products in physical stores as well and make maybe a um, big launch announcement on how you are entering the Japanese market and how um, your brand is available in Japan also in retail stores but not only online so people can actually come see and touch your product. Now this was the episode about sales channels and uh, in the next episode we're going to talk about cultural considerations in business. Uh, what are the do's and don'ts in Japan when doing business with Japanese? What do you have to take into consideration when uh, addressing uh, Japanese consumers, doing the marketing with Japanese consumers, business negotiations, and so on and so on. So I'm looking forward and I'm excited for the next episode as well. Um, I uh, encourage you to uh, leave me comments and questions about this episode, about future episodes in the comments below uh, or in social media and uh, share your thoughts. Let me know what you think and maybe you have another subject or a, um, uh, yeah, a theme that you want me to cover. Um, I'd be looking forward to hearing from you. And again, I thank you for uh, listening to the sales channels in Japan. Um, I hope that you found something of value in this episode. Uh, this is Eric signing out. Arigatou gozaimasu.